morning, everyone. Um, today I am going to speak on the Euro crisis. You know that I have written a book on this. This has been published in many languages. Um, I always forget, I forget one, one language, so this time I will start in the East. It's Bulgarian, Greek, Romanian, Polish, Slovak. Italian, uh, German, Dutch, um, Spanish, Portuguese, European, Portuguese, and Brazilian, Portuguese, American, English, British, English, and then forthcoming are also uh, French and Russian. So I think this time I haven't forgotten anyone and I don't hurt anyone's feelings. So, um, it's, it's in, the, in the news every day, the Euro crisis. Um, this week it looked again like it was falling apart, but then, but then yesterday came the um, president of the European Central Bank, Mario Draghi, and saying he would do anything uh, that he could uh, to prevent the Euro falling apart. So of course, banking stocks, especially in stock markets and generally, short yesterday. So to give you a broader picture on the euro, um, one should uh, combine a political and historical analysis with an economic analysis uh, to, to really get a, get a feeling of the crisis and to understand what has happened and what may happen in the future. So um, there's there are basically two visions for Europe. Well, one you may call the libertarian or better maybe the classical liberal one. Um, these were, I mean, just tendencies. The founding fathers, fathers of the European integration of the European Union, they were closer to, to this vision. Uh, so Robert or Schumann, Konrad Adenauer, Alcide de Gaspari, they, they were closer to this vision. They were still influenced very much by the experiences of World War II. They were convinced that um, in order to have peace, uh, lasting peace in Europe, you would need uh, free trade. And uh, for them, the most fundamental Christian and European value would be individual liberty. In Europe, there would be still sovereign states, and, with private property, pri private property rights defended, open borders, and a free exchange of goods, services, capital, and ideas. So for, for this vision, um, the Treaty of Rome of 1957 was uh, a first victory because it established um, yeah, the liberty, the free movement of goods, of capital, um, of persons and services. It was not, a, but it was not a convincing uh, victory. It was, if in soccer we would say it was maybe a three-one, because the other side also scored. Um, because in the Treaty of Rome, the cap was introduced, the common agricultural policy, which amounts to central planning in agriculture. So this libertarian vision just wants to bring back the. I wanted to bring back what classical liberalism had achieved in the 19th century with free trade, but then had been lost in the age of nationalism and socialism and two world wars. So for, 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 for this vision, for a harmonic cooperation in Europe, you only need liberty, you don't need a European super state. In fact, this vision is opposed to such a European super state because it's seen as a danger to individual liberty. And as the founding fathers were also Christians and belonging to uh, Christian democratic parties, they saw the borders of the European Union in, in, in Christian countries. They were all also all Catholics, so they subscribed to the principle of subsidiarity. That, is, that means to trying to solve the problems at the lowest institutional level possible. For them, you don't actually need central European institutions. Maybe the only one that would be acceptable would be a central European court that would defend the four liberties and resolve conflicts between states. 
Then on the other hand, on the left side, we have the socialist vision, or also called the empire vision. Uh, like uh, politicians like Jacques Delors or François Mitterrand, they back this uh, vision and uh, nationalists, socialists, social democrats, social con they all favor to more or less this vision and they want Europe to be a fortress, to be protectionist to the outside, uh, with terrorists and interventionist to the, to the inside. So it's this empire, empire, fortress vision. And, they, and they, yeah, they do dream of a central European state that is directed by technocrats. And in their dreams, I suppose, they are these technocrats. So they are the empire uh, controls the periphery. The, um, the sovereign state stopped to, to exist, the central legislation, a European super state that redistributes between nations, and there's regulation and harmonization at an ever higher level. And again, the, the vast majority of the political class, the bureaucrats, the interest groups, the subsidized sectors, they all are in favor of the central state uh, because they want to use this to enrich themselves. Actually, the idea of a central state in Europe is not nothing new. Um, several um, politicians have tried to achieve it. Charles the Great, Napoleon, Hitler, Stalin. They all wanted a central government in Europe. They tried to achieve it via military means, uh, but they failed. And now a little bit less violent means, political means um, are used. One of the tactics that is employed is what uh, Robert Hicks explained uh, to you, that in a crisis situation, when there's a crisis, then you use the fear of the citizens to press forward towards more power for, for, the, center, for the government. So to introduce new institutions and to assume more power. Um, you can see it also in the Euro crisis. Um, the European Commission behaves as if Greece, Ireland, and Portugal would be their protectorates, um, supposedly protecting them against evil speculators um, that sell, sell their bonds. And they, they tell the, the, the Commission tells them what to do, how to reduce their deficit, to raise taxes, for example. And the ECB also expanded uh, its business, it, it's expanded its balance sheet, it started to buy for the first time government bonds that it had not done before, assumed this um, authority, and also totally new institutions were, were installed, uh, like the European Financial Stability Facility or the European Stabilization Mechanism that all amount to some socialization of government debt. So we have these two visions opposed, and there's a, a struggle between them because more power for the central state obviously means less uh, liberty. So who is on which side in this battle? Well, this is also only a tendency. So traditionally, the Christian democratic parties have been closer to the classical liberal side. Uh, Countries like the Netherlands, uh, Germany, Ludwig Erhard, or uh, Great Britain with Margaret Thatcher, they have been closer to this vision. While the social democratic parties, the socialists, um, usually under the leadership of uh, the French political class, uh, tend to support the, so the socialist side. And France is an um, important case because uh, after the humiliation of 1940 and the loss of the colonies, the French political class was looking for a substitute, substitute for its lost empire, in, and it was looking for it in Europe. And the French political elite also wanted to prevent that Germany would um, re recuperate its natural weight in the center, center of Europe and Want to prevent, wanted to prevent that Germany would recover its lost territories. So the idea was to assume, absorb uh, Germany into a socialist European Union under the leadership um, of France. 
So this fight was going on, the struggle, and it looked like that the socialists were winning, winning slowly because the European Union uh, was getting ever more power, the, the budget of the European Union was rising, ever more regulations. Um, there's also an implicit tendency built in uh, the EU because the EU Commission has the right of initiative for new legislation. This is uh, something unique worldwide that is not the parliament that proposes new legislation, but the government it would be like, like uh, yeah, the government of the United States proposes new legislation and, and then Congress may say yes or no and nothing else. So there's an implicit tendency towards uh, more centralization, more power for, for the, the government. So it looked like the socialists were winning, but then one unexpected event happened, an event that Mises had predicted 70 years ago, that is uh, communism collapsed and the Berlin Wall came down. So this changed the scenario completely, because what does this mean for the fight of the, of the two visions? For one, Germany would gain power through reunification, and Germany was closer to the classical liberal side and opposed to the centralization. Moreover, the states of the East, former communist countries like Czech Republic, <laughs> Poland, Hungary, they, were, they wanted to join, they were pushing towards, towards Europe, and they of course were tired of socialism and empires, so they would then naturally join the classical liberal side. So the balance of power was at this moment about to tip against the socialists. So what did they do? Well, first of all, they tried to, or, and they did prevent a fast extension eastwards of the European Union, because they thought if, they, if we extend it too fast, then this whole thing will become just a free trade zone, and we don't want that. Um, so, and at the same time, they said, we have to hurry up. We have to hurry up, hurry up now with centralization. And uh, the means for this centralization was the single currency, uh, the euro. The euro. So when the Berlin Wall came down, this presented a unique uh, opportunity for, for the French political class. Here we have Francois Mitterrand. Mm. Because the, the, the French political class wanted to get rid of the discipline of the Bundesbank, the Bundesbank is the German central bank. There was a saying that the most feared institution after after the Wehrmacht, after the Second World War in Europe was the Bundesbank. Why? Because the Bundesbank had a very, <laughs> well, it was not as inflationary as the other central banks. So if, if the Bundesbank did not print much money, the Bank of France couldn't print much money either, because otherwise the French foreign, their currency would devalue. And they did not really want to value, the currency because it's very emba embarrassing. It's also a clear sign for the population that there's inflation, it's a, sm a smoking gun. So if they want to, and it also uh, disturbs uh, inter international cooperation. So if you don't want to devalue, you have to follow the policy of the Bundesbank. So, and if the Bundesbank did not pr print much mother money, the Bank of France couldn't either, which meant that it couldn't monetize as government debt as it wanted. And as it could not buy with the new money as much French government bank uh, debt as it wanted, the French, gov uh, French government could not spend as much as it wanted. So by its restrictive monetary policy, the Bundesbank was implicitly, uh, indirectly, also restricting government spending in France. So actually the losers of the war were restricting the government spending of uh, one party of the winning side. Why, why was the Bundesbank, the German 
central banks, so not, not so, much so inflationary as other central banks, but basically because German, uh, Germans um, learned from their errors. Of course, they twice in one generation, they lost all their savings. There was a hyperinflation in 1923, and after the second lost world war, there was also a monetary reform where almost all savings were lost. So even though German politicians wanted inflation, the German public was very, very opposed to it. And the German politicians, of course, wanted to influence the Bundesbank that it would inflate more. But in this struggle against the Bundesbank, they couldn't win because the Bundesbank had the strong support in the population. Everyone who dared to touch the independence of the Bundesbank would lose elections. So, so this, the Bundesbank presented a limit for French inflation and French government spending, which had to be reduced. Um, there's one anecdote at the end of the 1980s there's a meeting between French and German diplomats. The Germans want to speak about some nuclear bombs, short-range nuclear bombs installed at the German border that only reach into Germany. They say, well, it's not really a comfortable position for us. You have this short-range atomic weapons installed at, near the border. Uh, and then the French answer, well, we, before we talk about this issue, let's talk first on the German atomic bomb. And then the Germans said, yeah, but uh, surprised, naive, well, but you know that we are not allowed to have atomic bombs and we don't have atomic bombs. And then the French replied, well, we, we mean the D-Mark, the Deutschmark, the German currency. <laughs> so, so you see, they equate this monetary or economic power with military, military power, and they wanted to get rid of it. And the fall of the Berlin Wall provides this opportunity, and Mitterrand actually, uh, in September 2010, when some archives were opened, so now it's already a proven fact, before there were only voices or uh, witnesses who, who said so, now, now it's a proven fact, Mitterrand demanded the, the single currency, the euro, in exchange for his permission for human, um, for German reunification. Well, you might ask, why did Germany need French permission for reunification? Well, when you, if you recall the situation of 1989, Germany is still occupied by the four, four allies, also by the French, is militarily vastly inferior to France, mm. so mm, there was almost no way not to, to give in. And Mitterrand even threatened by saying, literally, uh, quote, if we don't step forward with Euro European integration now, meaning introduce the single currency, we will have the same situation as 1913, which is one year before the First World War broke out. Um, and the German political class has this uh, great fear of isolation because Germany ha was isolated twice now in the 20th century, fighting a two-front war. Uh, so they didn't want to repeat the situation, which meant they gave up the Deutschmark in exchange for the permission, French permission for unification, which was, of course, an important victory for the socialist side. Why? Because the euro, the euro provokes by its set up sovereign debt crisis that then can be used for further centralization of political and fiscal power. And this explains why, why the end of the euro would also mean the end of, for the socialist vision, at least in the, in the short and medium term. And that is why they will do anything to defend uh, the euro. So this on the political origin. And now let's go more to the economic reasons. Why did uh, high inflation countries, in Germany we call them club med countries, I mean 
Club Mediterranean, Italy, France, Spain, Greece, Portugal. Why did they want the euro? Well, the first reason I already explained, they wanted to get rid of the Bundesbank that put in, in, indirectly this discipline, imposed this discipline on the other central banks. And for, Fra for France, um, it was also a power question. You could also get, if you had the euro, euro, you could try to get the prestige of the Bundesbank for your new uh, currency and have a stronger currency. Seniorage is another reason. Seniorage is the profit from central bank money production. And uh, this is an interesting case because how in the euro system, how are the profits distributed? Well, in the first place, why do, the, why do central banks have profits? Well, they have assets. For example, they give loans to banks and then they, they get interest. So all central banks in Europe put in one pool uh, the interest payments, the profits, and then these profits are paid back to the individual governments. Well, first to the central banks and then to the governments. And how, how is this pool then shared? Well, if it would be in function of the assets of the central banks, then everyone would get the same back. It would make no sense, no. The, the, pro, the profits are remitted back in function of a figure calculated by GDP and population. So that is why some countries get more and then they get out. Well, unsurprisingly, Germany, Germany get less back than it paid in and, and so Germany loses and France wins also in this. Then lower interest rates for government debts. This was very interesting for inflationary countries. Why lower interest rates? First of all, because the risk premium in, uh, in, the, inf in, in the interest rates on government bonds would be reduced or was reduced because uh, of the implicit guarantee of the stronger countries to bail out the weaker countries. And also the inflation. Infl uh, inflation, uh, inflation premium in the interest rate was also uh, reduced because it was thought that the ECB would be like a copy of the Bundesbank and very conservative. So this meant that the interest rates for on government debts in the peripheral countries was reduced considerably which meant that there was, a, there was additional margin for government spending uh, and to accumulate more debts. It served for some countries also as an excuse for austerity measures that would have been necessary anyway. In the early 90s, some countries such as Italy or Belgium, they were already at the verge of sovereign collapse. Um, sovereign insolvency. So they had to do some reforms. They had to privatize. They had to reduce some government spending. Uh, of course, this is very unpopular. But if you can tell the, your population, well, we have to do all this. It hurts a little bit, but we have to do this to get into the euro. And once we are in there, we will be fine. Then you can sell it to your population more easily. There's monetary redistribution. As I will show you later, that the, the new money was not introduced in all countries uh, in the same measure. And last, uh, these inflationary countries would also get a stronger currency and have more, more imports, higher stand standard of living. Before the euro, in Germany, when there was, uh, when Germans would work hard, when there was capital accumulation, and they would have more exports, and then the D mark would rise in value, the German currency would rise in value, which meant that the benefits of the hard work would be spread to all of the population, because then they could import cheaper, or go cheaper on holiday in, in the south. Now, the, the benefits of the hard work are, which leads to a tendency of a stronger currency as a spread, uh, spread to the to the um, peripheral countries, who got a strong who got a stronger currency than they would have had otherwise. Cheaper imports, 
And this coupled with the lower interest rates led to a consumption and investment boom. So these are the graphs for the last slide. So the first thing that I mentioned was um, that the interest rates were reduced in the th southern countries. They actually fell to the level of Germany. So, when it be so the, the red line is Germany. So when it became clear which countries would join the euro, uh, the interest rates were reduced. The risk premium was reduced. The inflation premium was reduced. So they approximate the German interest level. Here with Greece, we have still a, a gap here because Greece would not join the euro in 1998, but only it would only falsify the statistics later, and so it would join in 2002. So there's still here this gap. Um, here we have the balance of trade. We see an export surplus of Germany that is uh, compensated by import surplus of other countries. And as I said, the export surplus makes your currency uh, stronger and the import surplus weaker. And if you see this, uh, um, if you see this uh, in time, this has even increased. So this is Germany. The German export surplus has increased, while the trade, balance of trade has has worsened for for the southern countries, the peripheral countries. This is their competitiveness based on, measured by unit labor costs. So if this goes up, you get less competitive because you are, you, you are more costly. So you see here that um, the peripheral countries use the euro, the time of the euro, uh, to have wage rates to increase, to give in to labor unions that want to have higher wages. So their competitiveness uh, decreased. They had, they had a good time, they had a party, but the competitiveness increased, decreased. Um, while in, the, in other countries like Belgium, the Netherlands, Austria, and Germany, the picture looks different, especially in Germany where the unit labor costs uh, were reduced and Germany is much more competitive than it was in 1995, 15 years ago. So what does, did this mean for the standard of living? You have here some countries, you see the retail sales, like you in the US, France, and the UK from the last 15 years. They increase, so people consume more, have a higher standard of living, while in Germany, there's just stagnation. There's just, just stagnation in consumption. If you, we take a peripheral country like Spain from 2000 to 2007, only, only seven years, retail sales increased more than 20%. Yeah. While in Germany, people, people are not better off. They, it's just a stagnation of living standards. The monetary redistribution here, you see the increase in M3. It's kind of chaotic. Graph, but um, the big thick line is uh, Germany, which is a tendency to be at the lower lower range. While other countries like uh, Spain or Greece, they have much much higher growth of uh, money, money of the money money supply. Okay, so now the question, the obvious question is, if Germany had so many disadvantages from the euro, why did they, why they, did they accept it? Why did they give up the DMARC? In fact, the population, the majority of the population, if there, there would have been a referendum, they would have not given up the Deutschmark. There, there, were, there were economists that, that signed letters to the government not to do it. Lawyers went to the constitution, constitutional court to, to pressure against the euro. 
However, the German elite wanted the euro, so why? The first reason I already explained, no, that there was this pressure um, by, um, by France to sacrifice the DMARC in exchange for German reunification. Uh, the second reason is that German politicians, of course, also, also wanted to get rid of, of this stubborn Bundesbankers that would uh, not inflate enough. So this was a way to get uh, rid of them, or get, to get rid of the influence, as we see now. Uh, strong influential interest groups were in favor of the euro because they basically wanted the socialist vision to go on. They wanted more harmonization, for example, of labor standards that are very high in Germany. They wanted to impose it on their competitors or environmental standards that uh, were high, very high in Germany, so they want to go impose these standards on the other countries. German exporters uh, were in favor, or big German exporters were in favor of the euro because without the euro, there would occur, occasionally there would be devaluations and a very strong pressure to innovate on them. But here, um, I would like to make the following comment because you often hear the argument that Germany is the great benefiter of the euro because it has so, so high exports and without the euro it wouldn't have it. Well, if we look at it from the point of view of an individual, what is really important are not the exports. When I, when I uh, sell my suit or when I give, give a lecture, uh, I'm selling goods and services. I'm exporting to the rest of the world. While when I, uh, when I buy a laptop or when I get a haircut, I'm importing goods and services. So if someone would ask me, hey, Philip, do you only want to export or do you only want to export, ex import? Then if I would have this choice, obviously I would only, uh, well, I may, I may give here this, this lecture, but I may only um, import. Um, because it's much, much nicer, you don't have to work, you just, just get all the things. Um, so the important thing is to import, and only to import, this is actually what, what Southern Europe did in the last 15 years. They imported much more than they exported. So then to say that the big advantage of Germany is that it had such an export surplus. No, it makes me laugh. Um, banks also were in favor of, um, of the euro. Why? Because, as I said, some countries in the early 90s, they had already, Italy and Belgium, had more than 100% public debt per GDP. So they were on the verge of bankruptcy. So if Italy and Belgium collapse, their banking system collapse, there's a, probably a banking crisis in Europe. German, German banks may collapse, so would German banks be in favor of the euro? Of course, and they still are. So they wanted to prevent this sovereign and financial collapse by just merging to a bigger thing, to the euro. So now we, call, we come more to the um, monetary setup. The ECB, the central bank, they create the monetary base, they print euros, and the banking system creates money titles on top of this. Hmm. So um, this, is, oh, this is in contrast to the Fed, no? the, in the Fed, where here, here we have it's a system that the government spends more than it receives in taxes, and for the difference, it prints paper and writes on it government bond. And uh, the banking system buys these, these, these bonds, so the government gets new money. And then the banking system sells it, the bonds to the Fed and gets new reserves. And this is very, very nice to have new reserves because then you can expand credits, which is, uh, or pr produce more money, which is a very uh, nice business. So then, um, the bonds are the property of the Fed. The government has to pay interest on the bonds. 
and then the Fed at the end of the year has a profit because of the interest payments, and the majority of these profits are then paid back to the government, which meant that the government never has to pay their debts. Because when the bonds comes due, come due, they just issue a, a new bond. So it's a very nice way to finance yourselves, to finance your expenditures. In case of the ECB, it's a little bit different. Because they're the governments, they, when they have a government deficit, they issue bonds, they get money from the banking system. But here, traditionally, the ECB has not bought government bonds. What the ECB did is to give loans to the banking system, but in exchange for these loans, they said, well, we need a collateral, we need, we need a guarantee. And we accept, well, some kind of securities, but the best that you can offer us are government bonds. So the banking system pledges bonds as collateral for new loans at the ECB and get then the new loans, the new reserves, and can then expand credit. So here the difference is then that the, legally the bonds are still the property of the banking system, which means that the government pays the interest on the bonds to the banks. And then of course the banks have to pay also interest on the loans from the ECB. And then the ECB remits the profits back to the government. Of course there's a slight difference because some of the interest payments remain in the banking system. Because the interest rate on the government bonds is higher than the interest rate on the loans uh, to the banking system from the ECB. So you, sh you should let your friends participate no, in this scheme. So it's, it's a more a just a system in this sense. Um, so here you see the bank holdings of government debt in the EU. So you see two trillion euros of government bonds are held by the banking system. You will see here when the financial crisis hits in 2008, governments have to issue more government bonds. There's a deficit, high, very high deficit, so, so they issue the bonds, and then they tell their banking friends, hey, you have to buy, more, buy, you have to buy, buy these bonds. So you see here a strong increase in the bank holdings of government debt that then the banks use and go to the ECB to get new money. In percentage, it was in 2010, th almost 30%. 30% of all government debts are held by banks in the euro area. Probably now it's even higher. In, com in comparison, in the US, US, it's only 11%, which makes totally sense because in the, in the US, as we have seen, the Fed just buys the bonds, so it's not property of the banks anymore. So what is the difference between the two, the Fed and the ECB? Well, economically, it's very similar. In both cases, the money supply increases. In the case of the ECB, the money supply increases as long as ECB rolls over the loan to the banks, uh, that is when the, uh, when the loan comes due, they just renew it. And in the case of the Fed, the money supply increases also until the Fed sells the, the government bonds again. So the legally the difference is that in the EMU, the European Monetary System, the bonds remain the property of the banks and they are off the balance sheet of the central bank. However, in both cases, government bonds are effectively monetized. That is, there has been money produced to buy government bonds, to finance government bonds. So the bailout of Greece did not really start in 2010, uh, when the ECB started to buy Greek government bonds, but much earlier, because they, they accepted Greek government bonds as collateral for new loans, so that uh, the Greek government could issue bonds, the Greek banks could buy the bonds, and then go to the ECB and receive, or to the euro system and receive more money.
Uh, so one interesting question is, of course, if 30% of government, there's only 30% of the government bonds held by, by the banking system, who holds the rest? Well, for, for um, non-European banks hold European government bonds, foreign central banks hold government bonds, and uh, one Interesting aspect is the indirect monetization of government deficits. Government bonds are the preferred collateral in the euro system. So if you as a bank hold a government bond, it's almost as good as holding money because you can always easily go to the ECB, receive new reserves. This makes, it very, uh, makes government bond very, very liquid, artificially liquid. And you can always use it to get new reserves and then create new money on it. So to show it graphically to you, this indirect monetization through the euro system, this is what we have seen before. The government issues bonds to finance the deficits, gets new money. Banks go to the ECB, receive new reserves. Okay, so, th so maybe 30% of all this government bond is financed like this. It's sold by this, but here the story does not end because the banks have now higher reserves. What do they do with the reserves in normal times? They expand credit. They give loans to, uh, to a construction company, for example, who starts to build houses and to hire workers. So new money is created by the banks, goes to the, first to the entrepreneurs, then to the workers, construction workers. And what do construction workers do when they get the new money? Well, they will consume part of it, but maybe they will also save part of it and invest. Maybe in insurances, hedge funds, pension funds. And what do they buy with uh, part of this, this new money? Why not buy a very, very liquid asset uh, that... Uh, you can sell very easily that banks are very eager to buy. So uh, important part of the new money then ends up buying again government bonds. So this is the indirect monetization that is often neglected. Good. Here in the, in the euro system, there's also one important difference to the Fed because uh, in case of the Fed, only, only one government can use the Fed to finance the deficits. But in the case of the euro system, several governments can use one central banking system to finance the deficits. So therefore, all European governments or Eurozone governments have the incentive to run a deficit, to print government bonds, and to use them as collateral to get new money. So this is uh, what I call the tragedy of the commons. Um, in a tragedy of the commons, property rights are not defended uh, or defined well, and several users can exploit one resource. A common example are fishes in the ocean. They are not the property of anyone. Any fisher can fish them. So the incentive is to fish as many fishes as possible because if I don't fish them, well, the other fisher will come and get them. So it leads to an over-exploitation of the resource. Here we have the same thing. We have a public money that's... Uh, uh, property rights and money are not defended, um, and several governments can use one central banking system to finance themselves. It's like if we would have here a printing press and all of us could use it. So of course, if I'm, if I'm stupid, I don't use it, and you start printing the money and prices go up, and I look, <laughs> hey, everything is more expensive. I cannot afford anything anymore, so what do I do? Well, I, I also try to use the printing press and print the money for myself and bid up prices. So there's a redistribution. Mm. The important thing that is that I print faster money than you uh, because only then I can profit from it. If I, if I print money slower than you, 
then prices rise up faster, then I have, I have more money. So here we have a redistribution and the first receivers of the new money win, they buy at the old prices and then the prices rise and the people lose that have to pay higher prices before their income increases. So it takes, takes a case of Greece, the Greek government has a deficit, it prints bonds, the, the banks, banks buy them, they go to the, uh, send, uh, to the ECB, receive new reserves, they expand credit, the money supply increases and prices rise. But not only in Greece. <laughs> also in France, Germany, Spain, Italy. So the Greek government thereby can externalize part of the costs of the deficit. The cost of the deficits are here rising prices or lower purchasing power of money on foreigners. It's very nice because foreigners don't vote, vote for you in the next election. So you can um, um, promise um, gifts to your population and, and finance a, a welfare state while you make foreigners pay in the form of a loss of the purchasing power of money. The interesting thing is, of course, that not only Greece has these incentives, but all other governments as well. And here, again, the same is true that you, you only profit if you uh, exploit the commons faster than the others, if you fish more than the others, or if you print more than the others. Take the example that a, uh, Germany has a government deficit of 3% of GDP, and the rest of the Eurozone has a deficit of 10% of GDP. They, they buy bonds, the banking system buys them, prices rise. Let's say they rise on, they rise on average 8% in the Eurozone. This implies that even though the German government has a deficit of 3%, prices rise even faster than, than the deficit. That means that real German government spending may actually fall. So here you see the incentive to, have, uh, to profit from the monetary redistribution by having a higher deficit than the other countries, which obviously is very explosive. Indeed, the question that now is obvious is, why, why hasn't the euro not exploded already? Why is it still there? Why has, has there not been hyperinflation? Well, um, I made the analogy with the printing press that several users can use one printing press. And it's uh, good to understand the principle, but of course it's not a perfect analogy. There are some differences. Because governments cannot print euros. The only thing that they can do is print their paper and write on them government bonds. But then they depend uh, basically on two institutions. One is uh, banks that they buy these government bonds, and second, that the ECB accept these government bonds as collateral. So there's a risk involved that in this chain, that this, this chain breaks. For example, banks could, would, could, uh, could say, oh, no, we don't buy these bonds because the interest rate is not high enough, or we fear that you will default on your debts in the future. Or the ECB may, may say, no, we don't accept bonds of the Greek government anymore because the rating is so low, um, they may default. So there, there's uh, some risk involved in, in the scheme, which, however, I alleviated because the euro is a political project. That is why it's important to know the history of the euro and the political interests behind them. There, from the beginning, there was an implicit guarantee to bail out these countries uh, that would have financial problems. So, uh, indeed, the chain never broke, and it's still working. That is, banks still buy government bonds, especially the bonds of their own government, and the ECB still accepts them as collateral. Uh, Indeed, the ECB had, um, had promised, or they had the rule that they would only um, accept collateral rated at A minus, 
then this was redu reduced during the financial crisis to BBB minus. Um, but then the, it, the, Greek, the Greek government bonds um, received a lower or were expected to receive a lower rating and then the ECB said, okay, we will now accept uh, Greek government bonds even though they have a lower rating. Now they are rated junk and the ECB still accept them as, 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 as bonds. Uh, the same is true for Portuguese bonds. So you see, it's a, it's a why, because it's a political project, they gave in and the tragedy of the euro, of the commons is still intact. However, there was another limit for the tragedy of the euro, the tragedy of the commons, the use of the printing press, the stabili stability and growth pact. What is the stability and growth pact? Well, it, uh, if you imagine the fissures in the ocean, um, Governments uh, often, instead of privatizing the resource, they try to regulate the resource. They impose, for example, quotas. They name like 10 fishers and they say, you, each of us, each of you, you can fish this year 10 tons of fish. And they, they want to pre prevent, prevent the overexploitation of the fish in this way. The same happened here with the Stability and Growth Pact. There were quotas imposed on governments on their deficits. Uh, we're saying you can have a deficit of up to 3% 3, 3 of GDP. So this was the quota imposed. However, this limit um, was a total failure. Because basically, because if you, if you don't fulfill it, there's no, there's no, there isn't someone who punishes you. There's no, there are no penalties or sanctions. This explains why the countries had often more than 3% deficit of GDP, also Germany, France. Uh, in 2010, only two countries had less than 3%, um, Lux Luxembourg and Finland. And for Greece, for example, for the next 10 years, uh, for, for the next years, they suppose that they can have a higher deficit. Spain is allowed to have a higher deficit next year and this year. So that it was basically a voluntary agreement between fishers of saying, okay, let's only fish so, so much, but then at the end, no one was there to enforce it. So this explains why the euro is self-constructing, self-destructing, uh, self and provokes uh, the accum accumulation of debts and then the sovereign debt crisis, which then is used for centralization. And this also generates conflicts. It's not only instable, in but it generates conflicts. Bastian, Bastiat, Frederick Bastiat has, has this saying that if goods do not cross borders, armies will. So one of the pillars of classical liberalism is that free trade uh, fosters peace while uh, government barriers between nations generate conflicts because they lead to autarky and they le lead to the desire to get, to get rid of these barriers with arms, uh, with, the, with the war. While a free voluntary exchange leads to pacific and harmonic cooperation because you get to know this, each other, you, you depend, uh, you, or you know, you realize that you depend on, on each other for mutual be benefit. So Germans export cars to, to Greece, and Greece uh, exports uh, feta cheese to Germany, or Germans go on vacation for Greece, so everyone um, is happy. But this voluntary exchange is hampered in the EU in several ways. One is the redistribution through cohesion funds or regional funds, where basically you tax one country and you give it to another country to build a road uh, to nowhere, but there's also the redistribution through the euro. That, uh, for example, in, in, in Greece, the Greek government has a deficit. Uh, it pays <coughs> subsidies to maintain an economy rolling that is uncompetitive. 
it uh, pays, uh, there are too high wages in, in Greece, uh, labor unions are very strong, inflexible labor market, normally you would have a very high unemployment, but this unemployment is reduced by government spending because you just pay, or you pay the unemployed unemployment benef benefits or you hire them into the public sector or you send them in early and higher pension schemes. Of course, the result of this is a very high deficit, you live beyond your means, but to cover the deficit, you just issue the bonds that then buy the banks and use as collateral uh, for new loans from the ECB. The money supply increases and prices rise all over Europe. So there's a redistribution. The first that receives the, the first who receives the new money is the Greek government, and the people who receive from it, and then. Maybe the Greek minister, he buys a Mercedes in Germany, so the new money flies to Germany, bids up prices of Mercedes. The money stays in Germany because it doesn't flow back to Greece because the Greek economy is uncompetitive, prices are too high, so Greece has a trade deficit with Germany. So goods are basically exchanged for, in exchange for new money or debts that are never be paid, paid back. However, you cannot maintain this, this forever in an economy that is not competitive forever. So there was then the bailout in 2010 of Greece, the first one, then there was the second one in 2011. And the loans of the bailout were guaranteed by Germany to a large, large extent. And this then made the redistribution more transparent because all of that that I explained before 99% of the population has no, has no idea about it. But once you hear in the news, well, there's a bailout of Greece and we are um, guaranteeing it, then the redistribution becomes more transparent. And then you ask, why do Greeks have higher and earlier pensions than we in Germany, for example? Or why do they have paid vacations and we don't? Why shall we maintain their welfare state while, while we reduced it in the last 10 years. So of course, uh, tensions build up, Germans get angry on Greeks, they think that they are lazy. And G Greek media sh uh, <coughs> attacks back by saying that Germany should pay rep sh reparations for World War II. So, <laughs> You know, that is, that is true, but what is actually even more fascinating is that when there were some German politicians going uh, visiting Greece, uh, Greece uh, a member of the Socialist Greek Party told them that um, if Germany would not bail out Greece again, the, the, Ger the Germans would suffer the same fate uh, as the Germans in Crete in World War II where uh, there was almost a, uh, well, where many Germans lost, lost, their, uh, lost their lives. Um, so there are really tensions building up. The harmonic cooperation of the free market is substituted by conflicts generated by the incentives of the Euro system. The question now is at this point, who will uh, eventually pay for the malinvestments. Mm. That has, has been, well, there, ha there have been malinvestment in, in the Sp Spanish real estate sector that has been, have been socialized um, in part by, by the government by bailing out banks. There have been malinvestment in welfare states. So all this money is basically lost, has been spent on, on, on on housing bubbles or, or welfare state bubbles, public education bubbles, so all this money has been gone. Who will, who will pay for it in the end? Well, there are, several, there are six opportunities. One is that over-indebted peripheral governments pay. That is, they reduce their public property, they privatize, uh, the privatize public companies, they reduce um, government spending. They reduce their power, this would be the first. The second would be that core governments, the German government, Finnish government pay, uh, that is, German government uh, uh, privatizes public companies or the Finnish. 
The third option is the peripheral tax payers pay. That is, uh, there's tax increase in Greece. The fourth is that core tax payers pay, that there's tax increase in, in Germany and the fiscal union. There are fiscal transfers from Germany to the rest, to the periphery. Fifth, the users of the currency pay, that is, the ECB inflates the money supply to pay for all these debts. Or six, financial institutions pay, that is, banks go bankrupt. So the French government and peripheral governments, uh, they favor four and five. That is, they want basically German taxpayers to pay the bill and the ECB to, to, to buy even more uh, government bonds to print more money. So France and the, and the Latin countries, they push in this direction, while Germany and the Netherlands, they rather want peripheral governments to reduce their size. They also recommend tax increases in these countries. And they also t uh, talk about, or they wanted to, uh, that um, financial institutions suffer losses in debt restructurings. So who, who will win? Who will win? Well, the future of, the, of Europe and the euro depends on who will finally will win. And after this, how the tragedy of the commons will be addressed. So there are three possibilities. One is to reform the stability and growth pact. So there are harsh austerity measures and structural reforms in peripheral countries. So the deficit is reduced to 3% or even lower. That is the op uh, optimistic uh, view of Huerta de Soto, that he argues that this should be done and will be done. The second is uh, that the Eurozone splits up because the loser is too dissatisfied with the outcome. For example, if France gets it, its will and G Germans pay in, in form of higher inflation, maybe then Germany leaves. Or if Germany gets its way and there are uh, harsh reforms in Greece, the government shrinks in Greece, Spain, Italy, and then, and then they leave the euro because they don't want to do it. Or Third option is that there are transfer union uh, and the cent centralization. Uh, we, we move through s slowly to a central European state. So, which considering the ge geopolitical power and also the past evolution of how the euro was introduced and the interest behind it is mm, probably the most likely. And this, with this positive outlook, I I leave you. I, th I think there are four books left. So, uh, in the book bookshop of my bookstore of my book. So you better start running. Thank you very much. Thank you.